structure. Um, uh, difficult, uh, difficult book to write. Uh, it's difficult to write about the future. Um, generally, best avoided, I think, because um, more or less whatever you say is bound to be wrong in some fairly fundamental way. Um, but nevertheless, I think our, our, our present generations on this earth do need to think about the future um, because um, it's pretty clear that um, we're confronting some major crises and we need a, a sort of fairly fundamental rethink of um, where we're going. Um, uh, and I sort of lay that out in the first part of the book. Uh, for me, probably the three key dimensions of change that we need to be addressing are firstly climate change, which already is... Um, affecting the world in all sorts of dramatic ways and, and, and will continue to do so. Um, secondly, um, I think energy futures, um, for all the talk of decarbonisation, uh, the fact is that globally 85% of the energy we use is fossil fuel based and um, even in Britain it's, it's, it's pretty close to that, uh, about 80%. Um, and it seems to me fairly implausible that we're going to be able to decarbonize uh, our energy supply quickly enough um, uh, whilst retaining current levels of energy use, um, certainly in the wealthy countries. And I think that is going to push us towards much more uh, local, regionalized and localized um, forms of agriculture and forms of economy. Um, and then in terms of the economy, um, over the last 50 years, uh, the global economy um, has grown on average by 7% per annum. Um, I think it's pretty clear that that's not going to happen over the next 50 years, uh, which in many ways is something to be welcomed. Um, but it does mean uh, I think it is going to provoke a lot of uh, crisis, a lot of difficult rethinking of how we, how we run the, the economy and already uh, you know, that's prompting economic and political crises of various kinds. And I think if you put all that together, I think uh, in the coming decades, we're gonna be looking at, uh, a lot of people are gonna be on the move. There's gonna be large scale migration, uh, I think from coastal areas to inland, um, probably from urban areas to the countryside. A uh, country like Britain probably will see net migration, uh, net in migration as a result of climate change. And I think we're going to have to start generating our livelihoods, our material livelihoods, producing the food and fiber and other things that we need uh, more locally, um, more renewably and in more labor intensive ways um, uh, um, using lower energy inputs. Um, so that I suppose is um, basically what the you know, the, the position that I lay out in the book that I think is the context for me for talking about the sort of regional and local agricultures, um, how that is going to play out, uh, obviously, it could be in any number of ways, a lot of them um, fairly worrying and troubling. So that's partly why I think we need to be having these sorts of conversations to try and uh, accentuate the positive and, and to generate the best possible outcomes. Um, uh, in my book, uh, I, I talk about one possible way this could play out, um, I, borrowing from beekeeping, uh, perhaps a, a bit dubiously, um, I talk about the concept of the supersedure state. Um, and my argument here is that um, certainly in, in England, in Britain, and in most countries really that have gone through modernisation, um, we are we're looking at a world of quite strongly centralized states. Um, uh, in, in England, the, the sort of lines of political and economic power converge quite strongly on London. Um, and I think that's not going to change overnight. Centralized political power isn't going to disappear in the face of these various crises. Um, but um, I think um, it will weaken um, and the, um, the uh, what centralized states uh, demand from us in our uh, regions and localities and what they offer from us, I think will weaken. Uh, and so people will need to create new kinds of institutions and build the autonomies that I mentioned in my title uh, as, uh, as best we can. You know, the, the, the queen bee in London uh, will, um, you know, will, will not be in charge of the hive quite as much um, uh, as previously. Um, and so we're gonna have to generate livelihood capital uh, renewably 
uh, mostly from our local ecological bases. Um, and I mean, a lot of um, a lot of people here um, I know, um, and just generally, that there, there, there's a lot of interesting creative thinking going on around exactly these points. Uh, there's the Preston model that's quite well known um, of local government in the north, uh, where I live here in Froome, uh, that Froome, the independent Froome Town Council has been quite influential and generated the flat pack democracy movement. Um, uh, there's a whole series of interesting things going on in the so-called new municipalism of um, cities, towns, areas, um, sort of generating, um, generating their own um, self-control locally um, and all sorts of uh, amazing things going on in the agricultural sector. Um, but I guess um, partly I think um, what we've done so far is, is nothing compared to um, what we're going to be called to do in the years to come that we, we just have to push that forward uh, very much more and we perhaps lack um, some political or intellectual frameworks for uh, putting that all together in, in positive ways. Um, and that's really what I wanted to um, sort of focus the discussion around. And I, I, I put on the chat sort of five and in my blog post that I linked there, five uh, general areas uh, for discussion. Um, one of them I think is about uh, moving away from farming, producing agricultural commodities for non-local markets and more towards meeting local needs. So in Britain, generally, historically, um, the focus has very much been on cereal production, wheat production uh, and beef. Um, um, you know, uh, obviously, it varies from place to place, but that's been a sort of key focus nationally. I think in the future we're going to need to be um, more diverse and creative than that. We need to start thinking about woodland um, and sort of you know managed woodland resources um, being integrated much more closely into the places that we live. We need to think more about horticulture. We import uh, so much of our fruit and vegetables um, and we import a lot of the labour uh, even to manage the uh, domestic production. Um, we need to think about generating more of our fertility locally rather than importing uh, nitrates and phosphates via the fossil fuel economy um, and all sorts of other issues, seed provenance, um, medicines, other trades uh, serving agriculture locally. So there's a whole bunch of reconfiguration that needs to go on. We need to um, work out how to farm in low impact ways for local needs in a lower energy economy. And I think that's gonna be a really steep learning curve um, uh, for us collectively. A lot of interesting issues about scale there and also educational needs to make that happen. Um, and I think you know, we'll, we'll need to reconfigure local landscapes and not necessarily assume that the existing farmscape is going to serve those longer term needs. I mean, where I live, for example, there's a strong tradition of uh, family dairy farming, um, but that largely arose in the 19th century um, due to the advent of the railways and the demand for fresh milk in London. Uh, so although we grow good grass here, um, you know, to some extent, um, that, that tradition arose out of a non-local modernizing need so I think you know we need to re rethink local farmscapes um, uh, very deeply so that's the, the, the first theme is um, producing for local needs um, secondly what would the settlement geography of this localized small farm future look like um, Historically, in low energy societies, you tend to get a kind of nested settlement hierarchy from farm to village uh, to market town to provincial town and so on with uh, kind of relations of service going both ways um, uh, between those units. That has pretty much been broken in um, modern times by the advent of cheap energy and global um, global uh, commodity farming so that you know you go into a supermarket more or less anywhere in Britain and you know there might be a little bit of local colour but uh, essentially it's the same stuff uh, coming from wherever in the world it's cheapest to produce that stuff um, 
so there's a huge amount of rethinking I think that need, needs to be done there um, in terms of uh, lower energy futures uh, and also in terms of population movements um, I guess it's kind of easier urbanization is easier than ruralization sort of people uh, moving to um, sort of geographical centers that that, that sort of uh, that are um, that, you know that draw them in economically is kind of easier than dispersing to produce um, uh, to, to, uh, in, in a more sort of di dis dispersed economic um, situation so you know sort of thinking about ruralization or de-urbanization um, I think poses a lot of tricky issues so that's the the, the, the second set of issues um, thirdly what would land ownership models look like um, uh, historically in um, low energy um, agricultural societies uh, the people who control the land I mean that pretty much determines politics that pretty much tells you who's in control of politics in in Britain over the last century or two rural land ownership hasn't been massively important politically the the, 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 the political controllers are not the people that necessarily own um, rural land uh, but that uh, that is set to change I think you know as um, as these various changes um, uh, begin to manifest control of rural land is going to become more and more crucial uh, and there's a worry there that um, high demand for access to farmland population pressure on farmland um, uh, uh, is potentially going to create a situation of landlordism and enormous inequality uh, and I talk about this uh, a bit in the book you know are there resources to push against that um, possibly the uh, diverse population pressure uh, on rural land will create um, a, a, a sort of counterbalancing forces weak political centers won't necessarily be able to um, enforce land ownership and legal ownership quite in the way that we're used to the uh, ideas of liberal rights and human rights that I think you know, um, we articulate in present politics are going to be really important to hang on to all that so I'm interested to think about different models of land ownership and how we can counterbalance the potential tendency to enormous inequality and landlordism that has historically been a problem in agricultural societies and then fourthly um, I'm interested uh, particularly from a, 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 a northern perspective or from uh, any any particular region or locality how regional and local identity might play into all this uh, personally I'm worried um, about the dangers of pre-existing identities becoming forms of economic exclusion there's a great danger of, of, of sort of here first minorities or the whole language of the real people of the country um, that, that can be articulated as um, as populations move and the, the, the kind of present situation is resorted so I'm interested in, you know, in terms of the, the northern real farming uh, conference to think about northern identities in that sense you know is is there a northern identity obviously you know it's um it, it, there, there's uh, it, you can sort of split it down in all sorts of ways scotland north of england yorkshire lancashire uh my mother was from uh, yorkshire uh she always talks about the west riding being a lad a lass from the west riding and not the not the east or the north riding so there's all of these sort of issues in play uh urban and rural identities obviously enormous ethnic diversity in the cities of the north um, so I'm interested to, to sort of hear how you think that will play out um, the kind of argument that I try and push in the book is that pretty much all of us in in the world certainly all of us in Britain are children of a, of a failing economic uh, modernity a sort of failing economic model and we need to try and come together to forge new identities as 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 local farmers essentially and in my book I draw on the traditions of civic republicanism uh, which has manifested I mean it originated in ancient Greece but it has tended to manifest historically in, in times of trouble and social breakdown and the whole idea of it is that there isn't some kind of natural prior um, political community um, that there's a kind of foundational moment when um, things change and the people who are in place 
need to come together without any pre-existing um, political identity and create um, a, a, a meaningful local, you know, a meaningful polity, a meaningful local political community and, and uh, in the situation that's before us, um, that I think is going to be grounded deeply in, in, in agriculture. So that's the, the fourth theme. And then finally, um, how, um, how these local political identities and the, the, the sort of reinvention of economic localism plays in the wider world. Um, how would this manifest in terms of relationships with London or the, 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 the weakening political center? And also with other regions, how do we build um, convivial uh, relationships um, you know, within our local farm societies with people who are uh, facing the same issues um, everywhere else in the country or everywhere else in the world. Um, and that's pretty much all I have to say. It's very general and broad brush, but I think in the coming decades, um, things are gonna uh, happen in ways that, are, that we've been utterly unprepared for in, in the way that it's happened over the last 50 years, over my lifetime. Um, so I'm interested in just hearing people's thoughts on how we best prepare for that and, and, and get the best outcomes we can out of it. Great, thank you, Chris. Thanks so much for that, um, that presentation of your ideas. And um, basically, we're gonna have a bit of a discussion now. Um, there's quite a, quite a few of us, but um, I think we're gonna keep the, the sort of floor open and, and as a plenary for now. Um, and then we can potentially break out into smaller groups if, if there is a felt need to, to get into more depth around some things. Um, there is a, two people have asked questions in the, in the chat already. Um, I sort of would encourage you to, to, to ask them again. So I have N. Yoxal, um, and um, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Sorry, Nikki. I realise that that's not very helpful, is it? <laughs> Having my initial and last name. Um, yeah. So it was really interesting to hear what you're saying, Chris, about. Um, and also, apologies, my camera's not working, so that's why you can't see me. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about um, centralised political power in Westminster. Um, we moved up to Scotland nearly three years ago, and it was really interesting moving north to a devolved. Um, you know, an area with devolved political power, experiencing that, it feels really different. Um, and it's really interesting kind of living somewhere that that has that. And obviously anyone in Wales and Northern Ireland will, will kind of recognise that feeling as well. And I'm interested in the kind of size of those regions, whether it's city, towns, country level distribution of power, what's preferable, does it matter? How big are the regions um, in, you know, regional agriculture. Um, I One of the jobs that I have is with the University of the Highlands and Islands and education in Scotland is split by region um, and the, the, U, the region of the University of the Highlands and Islands is the same size as Belgium geographically. So you know for us a region is the same size as some countries and I, I just find it really interesting about where the, the edges of those regions are, where they merge um, and kind of you know how, how fluid is that sorry lots of questions in one i'll be quiet now so you can answer um is it my job to answer <laughs> um, yes please <laughs> <laughs> okay um i mean i think edge edge to, to answer your last bit uh, i mean edges of regions i think are really fascinating because um you know historically they were always very unclear and um you know that we've had the the slow emergence of the nation state where the world is now divided into all these polities where you can look on a map and and see you know exactly where it starts and finishes and obviously that very often isn't how things are on the ground but that's there's been a huge amount of 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 sort of uh intellectual and economic and military uh labor to uh to, to sort of make those boundaries unfuzzy whereas in reality they, they always are fuzzy uh and um i mean i suppose really my my view is to bring on the fuzziness but I, you know I, i'm not sure 
I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it has to be worked out on the ground. You know, there isn't a sort of um, a, a, a top-down model that I can propose to, to uh, a, or a sort of idealised model as to how that would work. I mean, I think that the hard work that faces all of us is to actually manifest that and, and make that happen in, in positive ways. Um, in terms of the size of areas, I mean, again, it's a fascinating issue. And uh, I mean, I talk a little bit in the book about the, uh, which I think links to someone's question about um, commodity versus producing for local needs. I mean, certainly something that's happened um, in recent times, uh, or has been happening for a long time, really, but has, has certainly picked up after the Green Revolution is the dominance of um, cereal crops and, and like the, you know, the big 10 commodity crops. Um, and, you know, more and more, uh, we've become reliant on wheat and rice and maize and, you know, a few other things, uh, soy and so on globally. And a lot of those crops are produced in semi-arid continental breadbasket regions that are increasingly uh, at risk from climate change and water scarcity and so on. Whereas um, what you might call the more localised peasant staple crops like uh, potatoes uh, or plantains or cassava in, in, in warmer climates, um, you know, they, they have gone down in terms of their per capita productivity. Uh, and obviously grain is very um, processable, storable um, and, and movable. Um, uh, you know, if you look at some of the old um, literature from the 19th century of when you know of, of horse-based agriculture um, you know you could you could move grain about 60 miles um, um, the, the sort of cost of production and cost of transport equalized after about 60 miles uh, with potatoes it was about 10 miles obviously nowadays um, it's vastly more but I think we need to be you know the, the energy costs of trading and transporting are going to become more and more significant and then of course you know you get into the um the the, the difficult politics of conflicts around access to resources but um uh probably you've surmised by now with me talking that i basically don't have any answers to your questions um but these are all the things that i think you know that, that we need to be thinking about basically thanks chris um, John, John Thorns, you, you had a question. Would you like to ask that in plenary? Yeah, Chris, has, Chris has replied really. Um, my keenness um, with regards to markets. So if you want to expand something, you need a model. And I'm keen on what, mo what models are out there already. So if you look at successful businesses, normally they start off small, develop a model like McDonald's or Costa Coffee or whatever. Um, and I just wondered if there was any business models out there that Chris thought were worth expanding on. Um, uh, I mean, I could, well, I mean, I suppose, I, I mean, I, I, I've sort of come across, I mean, I run a little local veg box scheme or help or help to run it. And, um, you know, the, the, I think there's always that pressure as, uh, um, you know, that, that that's great. You sell to 90 customers and, you know, now you should sell to 900 and, you know I, I absolutely don't want to do that you know the you know that it's difficult sort of working these making these things work in in terms of all the pressures of the modern economy but um you know i think that the, the sort of expansionary expansionary business model um is 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 problematic but i mean i i suppose you know if i were to sort of try and summarize it in a in a sound bite i think we need to think about markets as actual markets that we as farmers are, are going to you know we talk about the market as this very kind of abstract um sort of thing you know market prices um and uh, we need to move away from that um and and you know to some extent we we sort of got into this slight mindset that the the, the modern global capitalist economy is about market trade whereas really it's not it's about dominating markets and generating as much capital return as possible so i think you know we need to the two models that i think we need to keep in mind are you know is what we're doing um restoring our, the local ecological base or or is it drawing down on it and you know are we uh, providing um you know, food and service for people locally by actually bringing uh, produce to market um, and I think that will um, 
you know that that we need to create the politics that will make that possible and i think that you know also we're going to need um you know there's going to be a huge pressure for uh for low carbon labor intensive work so we need far far more people in farming than we currently have and all of those things kind of connect together more people in small scale farming producing real food rather than commodity crops for local markets um don't know if that answers your question but that's that's sort of the way i would see it as having to go chris uh, chris walsh um you wanted to ask something in response i did i i also wanted to uh comment on that in the um i think the challenge like one of the initial um areas you talk about is is local need and we have lots of really good models of successful businesses but we're not addressing the real need we're, we're kind of using uh we're exploiting kind of trading opportunities so um that's a real challenge for us and and if we are providing uh commodity goods like you know the staples it's actually not making its way to those people in need so the real challenge i think is is taking what the good examples we have coming back to the earlier question of those economic models that are working but actually kind of really addressing the need rather than you know um servicing a niche market and that's kind of we have a lot of expertise now like more than ever before in in the kind of localized food economy but the market and uh economic factors and 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 inequality don't allow us to do what we need to yeah, yeah so i mean that's an interesting point so when you say the real need would i mean could, would, could you expand on that in terms of um what you know what what you mean there and what you know ways in which you think uh maybe we need to adjust our models of local food production so we run a relatively successful veg box scheme we supply 450 people a week but we're not reaching people who um are in food poverty for example um and in some ways we're kind of exploiting um uh a aff more affluent customer who who was bought into that kind of local food economy so i guess that's a challenge and then we're also not supplying um the vegetables that you know people are eating you know it's, it's we're not making money out of carrot we're not we're not able to ha we don't have a financial model that's sustainable because we sell pulses bread potatoes carrots onions you know we we make our money out of a higher value product yeah i mean i'd be interested if, if anyone else has uh, thoughts on that i mean i i think it is a sort of really intractable problem that we've sort of developed um you know historically this model of urbanization and uh cheap commodity food which is very often touted as um you know the whole trajectory of modernization is a sort of great thing to get people out of farming and to um uh, you know to, to to get people into better paid work in the cities but there are so many dysfunctional aspects of that um um you know the the, the kind of health issues of over reliance on commodity crops the the inequalities and lack of access to healthy food um and so on um and you know it's uh, I can sort of construct a larger scenario um, in which um, in the future um, uh, sort of tackles that in a general sense, but how to get from where we are now in terms of um, uh, um, uh, yeah, the need to uh, attack, uh, address those urban inequalities is, is problematic. I mean, I do know of models, I'm sure the work that you do in Manchester uh, um, uh, tackles this but you know groups like Tamar Grow Local in Plymouth um, you know I think have done interesting work in terms of prescribe you know working with local authorities in terms of health inequalities in Plymouth and and sort of working with the health service in terms of prescribing uh, a veg bag to people in need and so on um, but I mean it's a it's a very long slow haul from there to where we need to be longer term for sure. Callum had a question that was also maybe going to touch on this theme. Do you want to ask them now, Callum? And then Nikki has her hand up afterwards. Hey, yeah, um, kind of building on some of this conversation, I guess. 
Um, my question was about uh, how this vision of uh, regional autonomy could be reconciled with the discipline of the market, because obviously a lot of the problem here is not, you know, uh, like the, the the problems are like commodification. It's not about a mindset. It's about the fact that people def depend on profitability as a condition of survival. Um, you know, like if you if your enterprise isn't profitable, then you can't survive in the marketplace. And so that that has this like disciplinary force that compels people into export markets or premium goods and all of these other ways that are necessary for survival that basically lock a lot of people out of either they lock people out of access or um you know they they result in like um methods of production uh that are objectionable for all kinds of different reasons um and so yeah my question is like how do we how do we reconcile this vision with this reality like i'm, I'm just starting master's research now on the preston model which I think is a really interesting attempt to address some of these questions. But, uh, you know, when you talk to people about what the real cost of producing like a cabbage regeneratively is, you know, like uh, public procurement contracts will pay you a bit more, but they're not going to pay you enough really to actually make that viable. And so this kind of effect of market discipline continues to really present very, 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 uh, you know, hard constraints. Um, so within the, you know, within this context, I'm not a defeatist, but I'm, but you know, it's not, it's, uh, yeah. What do we do? You know, and, and this is an open question for everybody. I mean, I can, uh, I, I can, uh, have a go at answering that, but I'm, um, I'm open to other people. Um, let's, let's hear what Nikki, what Nikki's question or comment was about as she has her hand up and we've got a few other questions as well um that that sort of touch upon this maybe we can collect them and then you can can respond um to a few of these okay Chris. yeah nikki oh um thanks nina yeah um i was just going to kind of come back to the veg box csa discussion from a second ago because um the research is really interesting it talks about um and i was just trying to find the reference as callum was talking then but um yeah i was trying to um having undertaken some research into CSA, the research suggests that people on lower incomes are actually more um, loyal and more faithful to CSA schemes. Um, so they tend to have a uh, greater longevity in terms of, you know, sticking with the scheme over multiple years, whereas um, majority sort of middle class, higher income CSA customers tend to be more fickle and will go elsewhere if the mood takes them. And it's really interesting that actually if you, if as a CSA producer, you, or any sort of, you know, um, local short supply chain producer of food, if you're able to find ways to support people accessing food, like doing um, variable or flexible pickup points or trying to work with local schools or services that, um, people on lower incomes might be accessing on a daily basis then you're you're kind of bridging the gap in terms of access because um you're able to ensure that whilst going about their normal lives they're able to access that produce rather than having to go out of their way to get it because obviously time is is precious if you're working multiple jobs um so uh, or you're relying on particular bus routes and and uh, you're trying to use public transport to to access work for example so tapping into those kind of um services enable access to what might be considered um a, a more kind of middle class um, privilege of being able to to access those kind of localized supply chains so i think that's really interesting and it's i think we have a responsibility as small scale producers to think about how we can either in some way subsidize our product so that we can get it to people who wouldn't normally be able to afford it um you know, i'm really conscious that selling beef at 12 pound a kilo means that it's out of a lot of people's price range and that that's difficult um so yeah keen to hear from others what what their thoughts are on accessibility for that kind of product. Thanks, Nikki. And there was also a request if you could share that reference at all. Um, if you do have it, if you pop it into the chat, then then that will be saved. Yeah. Um, we have a few other questions. They touch what's upon slightly different themes. So I'm just waiting to see whether anybody has anything to say, maybe in this respect of like the question around market dependence and um, CSA alternative forms of of provisioning and distribution 
that um, overcome some of the food injustice we're seeing. So please uh, step in for that. Chris? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible to, to kind of bring these two things together where you've, you've got to give a fair price to the grower or farmer and on the one hand, and then you've got people living in, in food poverty. And um, it, it's, it's too big a thing for us to solve as individual kind of businesses or projects. It, it's, got to, it's got to come from somewhere else, ultimately. Um, the way that we've been trying to do it over the years is, is see if the public sector will, will step in and, and, and fund the kind of the public health, um, food poverty side of things. But it, it's far from ideal. The, the the problem we have is that if we if we try and do both of those things we're not going to do either very well and that that's the real challenge I, i'm 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 not pessimistic about this at all i i i think that these projects and enterprises are kind of like little beacons and and when we're allowed when the opportunity arises these things will flourish and will grow and will become more um, relevant to more people but at the moment um, there are so many challenges that need to be sorted out by other people who aren't us really politicians I guess. Thanks Chris. Peter did you have your hand up? Indeed, yes um, it, um, I work in County Durham um, uh, in the, the uh, County Durham Food Partnership and one of the things we've identified um, as being incredibly short is is j just any veg producers now i i have a, a sort of a, an under an underlying gut feeling that working on developing more businesses as in through a farm start program or something like that and um basing them and working with the communities that need the access to the um to to that um fresh veg more than anyone and County Durham is full of places that has no that have no access to to any fresh vegetables of any sort um, might might be worth a punt um, and part of um, the County Durham climate response is um, about trying to stimulate more um, local production in whatever form that takes and I would really like to try um, to bring some of that together so developing new businesses in areas where and in, in communities which sort of goes back to Chris's earlier point about um, local need and, and, and lo local cooperation um, sort of bring that together and see if we can make that work rather than it being a, a, a niche opportunity being it developing a business that will serve a local need it, I, I think that's worth a try. Thanks Peter. <laughs> Chris, do you want to do you want to come back to some of those things? Um, yeah, I could do. I, I noticed that Callum has just disappeared, just as I was about to try and answer his uh, his, his question. Um, but I thought it was interesting. His um, yeah, yeah, he used the phrase about the sort of global commodification locking people out, um, and that's exactly right. I think you know we, we uh, when we talk about the market, um, you, you know that that one of the discourses about the market is that it's it's kind of responsive and um in, in inclusive but actually you know it's not the, the whole way that the sort of global food commodification has worked is by locking people out and i mean i, I guess i've gone around the houses over the years thinking about you know what you know what resources do we have for challenging that system i mean it, i suppose part of where i came into my whole presentation is that the system is kind of collapsing under its own weight in numerous ways and so it's got to be you know basically we have to kind of seize um it, you know it, the opportunity to uh, you know for us not to be locked out of the capacity to produce our livelihoods so um and that i, th I think links to what peter was just saying um which uh, you know i i completely agree with you know there's all sorts of ways in which we need to um make particularly horticulture you know is, is is something you know is is really critical but you know part of it has to be not just about businesses but a, a degree of decommodification where you know we're talking about um uh sort of community gardens and oh hi callum i'm sorry i just tried to answer your question when you uh when you weren't there but <laughs> um uh 
uh, yeah, you know, I, I talk in the book a bit about the need for decommodification and to, um, yeah, you know, to try and break down um, the uh, distinction between um, you know, food production for the market and the ability to um, produce livelihood. And, you know, and that I think is going to be really critical in terms of building regional autonomies. And I mean, um, I think it was Nikki, I think, was talking about um, aspects of um, CSA provision that was really fascinating. Um, and it sort of kind of chimes a little bit with my experience as a grower. Um, I mean, certainly one context that I think is interesting is, um, you know, with COVID, for example, you know, we normally get about two or three new customer requests a week. And then as the supermarket tempted, we got about two or 300 um, in a week, um, which obviously we couldn't um, fulfill, but we did our best to, you know, we, we started growing on a bigger scale and prioritize people in need um, and so on. So I think, and, and, you know, that, Basically, I suppose what I'm saying is that there are going to be these system shocks, you know, as as there was with COVID, and um, uh, you know, it's it's gonna, you know, we we need to kind of try and seize these moments and and rethink access um, to, uh, I suppose, access to the means of production, to use uh, the old Marxist phrase. Thanks, Chris. So we also have Jane making a comment. She can't, um, her, her microphone won't, won't work, but um, Jane says that um, we sell Farmgate eggs. We charge 30p a box more than other Farmgate eggs. They sell well because people like the way we farm and it's rare breed hens extensively free ranging. This does allow us to donate eggs to our local food bank. It's a tiny difference, but it's how we've addressed issues of meeting needs of those in food poverty with healthy, nutritious food in some small way. Um, so I just wanted to read that out. And um, I would like to move back to some of the questions that were asked in the chat earlier, uh, that, that are of course all related, but that had slightly different emphases. So um, um, I'll, I'll start with reading out Jane's uh, earlier question. She says, I live on an island, Orkney, so concepts of local needs is interesting. What has happened to decimate our small scale farmers is that nearly three years ago, we lost the essential infrastructure of an abattoir. It's an example of how for small scale farmers to survive and thrive, some infrastructure beyond their capability to provide given cost of meeting all the regulations and waste disposal must be supported by the wider community or country. And then Peter had a comment to that. Peter, do you want to jump in and, and give your experience of abattoir? Um, I think it was Peter saying Jane's point about infrastructure is very important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm back on. Um, but I, I, as well as working for Food Durham, I also have a small holding and we, we rear um, sheep that we, we keep for 18 months and sell, a, sell us hobbits um, in, in boxes to a, a, a group of customers. And over the 10 years that we've done this, we've had to move Avatar twice. Um, the first one closed down. The second one is now closed down because, um, uh, because of, of COVID. And, and I'm not convinced that they will reopen, which means that I will now have to um, take my sheep that we spend 18 months rearing to the very best of our abilities, um, do it, doing the, the sort of regenerative farming and, and looking after wildlife and all of that stuff to an industrial abattoir. And I'm not at all convinced that that is the way I want my animals to come to their end. Um, so the the importance of, of a local infrastructure is absolutely vital. And, and I can't at the minute see how you resolve that. No, it's it's very tricky. And I think that, you know, the the infrastructure supportive of small scale agriculture is, you know, is 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 critical. And it's sort of, um, you know, it's a prop that's been kicked away. I mean, I. I don't have any um, particularly clever answers to addressing that in the here and now. I mean, I, I do feel though that the, you know, the kind of supersedure state idea that I floated earlier, I think that gets to a, a point when the centralized state, I mean, I, I suppose I have a, you know, I, I, other people might have different views on biosecurity. I suppose I have a, a somewhat cynical view about some of the uh, rules and regulations around animal health, which, you know, which, uh, which is essentially, um, yeah, you know, always to look for centralized, you know, centralized control um, to the, to the disbenefit of, of local production. But, you know, my feeling is that the 
the centralized state is you know as as we're seeing at the moment with sort of covid and brexit and everything else it, it's got more and more balls that it's trying to keep up in the air and um I, you know i think the solution has to be people saying locally uh, you know a a, a a a bit of kind of local uh, agricultural activism to kind of say well you know we need to slaughter our animals locally and um you know we're going to do this um uh you know we're not quite there yet in terms of um you know how how the, the relationship between localities and the state but uh, you know it seems to me that is going to be um the, the the reality longer term where you know that the, you know it'll be impossible to create a local livelihood and the local state will not be helping us particularly so you know that'll be the opportunity to make those sorts of things happen um and chris um chris walsh has made a useful comment to that as well um, about regional agricultural colleges uh, chris yes so, sorry um yeah i mean every piece of infrastructure that supports local regional farming has been downgraded and, and is being lost we're, we're going in completely the opposite direction on on all of these fronts really um we we run a farm start program um we were one of the first and, and we shouldn't be like we're not the best people to be doing this agricultural colleges should be doing this stuff Thanks, thanks, Chris. Um, there was also been EP. There was a um, a question earlier, uh, slightly different maybe, but also really interesting, on um, here first minority claiming rights and um, and elders. Uh, EP, are you still with us? Mm, no, actually, I don't see them. So. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll jump that question for now, but he was asking um, whether in your, Chris, or anyone else's experience regarding an elder's place in the politics of a farm, you know, what, what is that? Looking up to a person who has lived on a piece of land all their life and know it better than anyone else, but are perhaps looking to step down from roles that they have been in for a long time. That was the question, which I thought was uh, um, really interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, um, well, that's interesting. I mean, the, 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 there's the sort of the here first minorities thing I was referring to in some ways is, um, you know, the, the notion of, um, uh, sort of urban incomers coming with their, um, preconceptions about, um, rural life and, um, you know, it's a, a, a it's a, a a slightly different issue but yeah certainly um i mean yeah certainly honoring the knowledge that um that local farmers and local farm communities have is is really critical um i mean i also think honor, honoring the uh, the skills and the willingness of of incomers and you know people um wanting to get involved in farming and and sort of dealing with all the intractable issues that we have at are also critical so um you know that's i guess that's the context in which i invoke civic republicanism and the idea that you know there's the, that nobody has a kind of privileged starting place in this that we all have to kind of work it out together basically and john john thorns you made a comment in the chat about austria yeah I've been to Austria a few times, uh, not, not as recently, but they had a special government department for, for helping small farmers and their keenness was to keep communities together and jobs in the community. So maybe something like that could happen in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland or England. It would be great if DEFRA took that sort of enlightened attitude, wouldn't it? Um, but, you know, I, I guess the, you know, the reality is that um, yeah, you know that, that. I mean, a lot of other European countries have used the um, the, the cat regimen much more creatively than in Britain to support um, 
uh, small scale and uh, you know so-called high nature value farming where um, and, and have also capped the subsidy for really large farms and um, you know in the, the UK uh, as I understand it uh, you know decided not to do that yeah, and, and you know our our farming tends to be larger scale than in most other European countries um, so yeah it would be great but again it's it's one of those things where I think you know, is is it on the, the government's agenda or DEFRA's agenda? I'm, I'm not sure that it is. I, I think the, the 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 space to do it has to be in you know as 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 the sort of uh, number of balls they're trying to keep in the air um, gets bigger and bigger. That you know that it has to be a, I think a a, a, a a sort of groundswell to um, you know to to try and address these issues and, and not wait for central government to do so. Thank you. And Mickey, you, you, you were thinking of Crofts in this context, weren't you? Oh yeah, you just caught me with my mouthful then, having my dinner. Um, yeah, I think that's, again, since moving to Scotland, seeing a really different approach to the scale of what's sort of taken seriously. Um, in Scotland, you have, you know, real variety between Crofts through to um, medium, larger scale farming operations, and then thousands and thousands of acres of estate um being you know managed under under one land manager so there's real variety whereas in england it's far more kind of consistently around you know a couple of hundred acres mark or more but um and i think that's really interesting it changes the balance of of where i guess to an extent power sits um and it does mean that throughout policy um obviously agriculture policy is devolved so in scotland uh, if you read the program for government you know the government talk a lot about farmers and crofters it's not just farmers there's a recognition that it's a lifestyle and it's a um a really valuable part of the, the heritage and land use management in in scotland so yeah really interested in uh, probably as i said in my comment phil and jane both are as crofters are probably much better qualified to talk about it than i am but it's it's been an interesting thing to kind of see since moving north thanks nikki and and actually in extension to that um jane made a comment in the chat and i'll read that out again um this is directed um at you john um she's asking did you see if austria still has the 3000 abattoirs that i found mentioned in a scottish government document from a few years ago orkney used to have an abattoir on most of its islands austria managed to keep them despite and within eu legislation apparently do you know anything about that john i was looking at dairies uh, and nearly every village even 10 years ago still had a dairy farm and a dairy processing and the government was supporting them with um, machinery and testing and things like that so they could keep it going. So I, I wasn't in to the abattoirs. Peter, you had your hand up. The point that um, Chris made about um, not waiting for public policy to change is a, is a valid one, but we've been trying to do that for 40 years. Um, and we're making it an awful lot more difficult by going against public policy than if, if if policy change and, and I think the point that uh, Mickey makes is that Scottish policy is more open to smaller scale farming and that is definitely not the case in England. You know, I remember one of the, um, the uh, sort of recent discussions about the implementation of cap um, regulations in, in England and there was, a, there was a very distinct drive from DEFRA not to support anything of less than five, five hectares. Well, if you're, if you're a, a, a small scale producer, that soon cuts you off yeah it's true i mean that you know I, I think so much of this discussion about the future depends on you know the the exact pace and nature of of the changes that happen i, I mean but i think you know the the, uh, the scottish crofting model is a really fascinating one and i you know i, I don't know uh, as much as I probably should do about the history of it but my sense is that you know partly the emphasis on um on self on producing for self you know i think you know breaking down this this this, uh, this decommodification that i was talking about earlier and breaking down these distinctions between uh you know what a proper farmer is i, I mean I, i've often been described as not a proper farmer which i sort of wear as a badge of honor you know so i think you know we that's that's something that we we need to to, to work on but also i mean my sense of the history of scottish crofting is that to, to some extent 
it arose out of a historic trauma um, which was you know connected with clearances and um, and, and sort of um, yeah f um, models of economic development that 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 left um, a lot of uh, people in the highlands um, um, in in distress and um, that seems to me you know obviously the, the the specific history is going to be very different but I think we are facing those kind of traumas uh, in the years to come and the key thing will be to try and build out um, uh, uh, you know an, a, an agricultural politics um, out of that in 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 good ways um, you know perhaps using models like the crofting experience to to, to build on. We have some responses there to crofting um, as well. So Jane, again, is writing uh, in some ways it is, but there's also a lot of centralization in Scotland. Scotch beef and lamb really dictate how much most farmers produce meat. The breeds used carcass specifications. Crofting is a bit on the edge of all that, often where you'll find the native and rare breed, but they don't fit with the meat centralization. So, um, yeah, complications there as well. And, and, and Nikki, you, um, oh, Jane continues. My feeling is that the Scottish government is keen to hold up its crofters as real Scotland, but they won't put their hands in their pockets to support it as seems to be done in Austria. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the feeling that I've had from previous conversations. Nikki, did you want to, to add something to that? No, it's just to highlight that crofting counties are the key aspect there. So in Aberdeenshire, where us and Tappanoff, who's also in the chat, are we face similar issues to small farms south of the border? So you know, still with the um, sort of seven hectare limit. So um, yeah, there's there's challenges for it, as, as rosy as it looks. If you're not a croft because you're not in a crofting county, then you don't have the benefit of some of that extra support. Okay, thank you. I mean, I suppose you know one certainly sort of where you know in, in in england you know one historic aspect has been the county farms that i think is quite interesting which you know historically an attempt to provide small farms for for new entrants to to, to learn how to to farm and you know a lot of that again as with most of these things sadly we've been discussing has gone by the wayside as um you know essentially property values um uh, you know push local authorities into <laughs> divesting um, themselves of the of the county farm estate um, but again I see uh, I see their p potential there um, you know as some of the um, some of the sorts of um, system dysfunctions that I was talking about earlier um, come to bite us I think the whole way that we value land and property and you know the relative value of of uh, de you know residential development land and urban land vis-a-vis -vis rural land i mean i think all of that goes back into the mix um so um again you know I, I suppose i keep coming back to this it's but you know it's just uh you know the the, the it, it, it'll it, the, the the thing is for us collectively to sort of rest these um moments of change and crisis as best we can into in, in you know in, into a, a sort of positive agrarian outcomes Thanks, Chris. Let's see. Let's see who else pops while we um, have a moment to think. Chris Walsh, I see you comment again in the chat. Maybe just speak it up because um, there is nobody else in the waiting in line. Yeah, just uh, Chris, you touch on the challenge we face, which is the solutions or the, that uh, we need have to come about not through changes in the farming or the food sector, but more broadly about the economics of the country. You know, like where we invest our money, how we invest our money, debt, all those other things. And that's the real, real problem we have because, you know, people in the farming sector understand the problems and, and, and see the solutions. But until um, we make money in different ways or, you know, we do other things other than, you know, invest in a second home or, or build motorways. We're not. We're not going to see these farming solutions. 
Yeah, I think that's true. And I mean, that's certainly the way, you know, the way my thinking has gone or my, my writing, you know, I started off um, being, um, although I don't, you know, I wasn't originally a farmer or come from a farming background. I, I was sort of very taken with, um, you know, farming solutions to our, our problems, but actually at the farming, um, uh, you know, it's wrong to say that the farming is the easy part because, you know, you know it's, a, it's a tremendously skillful and challenging set of issues uh, to, to, to farm. But the, as you say, it's really the way it's uh, integrated into larger economic and political structures. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you're right. I, you know, I, I agree. Um, I mean, like you, I try, I, I try not to be despairing, but to, to, to be positive. But I mean, the point I keep coming back to really is that this you know it, it is going to change not not necessarily for, uh you know I, I, certainly we can't assume it's going to uh, change for the better but i think so much of the um you know the economic and political structures that have shaped um the the um the the, the, the kind of existing context of agriculture are going to change because of um global political and economic crisis climate change energy futures um and suddenly, um, you know, it's, it seems to me, obviously at the moment, the, the government has no real kind of food security or even any kind of food policy agenda as such. But that seems to me it's going to change because you do, you know, ultimately something that governments have to do is feed the, you know, feed their populations. And, um, you know, a bit like Tim Lang's recent book, I mean, I talk about it as well in, in my book, um, you know that's been pretty much taken as a given that you know we're a rich country we can buy what we need on global commodity markets um uh you know any any type of local food security or food sovereignty issue isn't really a problem for us but you know I, we're not going to be able to assume that um in in the future and and you know and that's when this stuff will will change and the moment that we have to seize i think And Jane said another thing, would like to um, raise another thing about crofting. And she says, um, one more thing about crofting that has something I think small farmers need elsewhere. The sense of community and working together. Crofting townships with common land rely on everyone working together to manage livestock on common land. For certain jobs on small scale farms, life is a lot better in so many ways if people get together to work together and be a stronger community. Peter, jump in and, and ask your question. It's not really a question, it's a response to Jane's um, point about cooperation. Um, you, you don't have to be a crossing community to do that. We, we have set up in, in our area, um, with the help of the North Pennines AOMB partnership originally, um, a smallholder network which brings together a whole lot of people who are um, running small farms, most of them on a very part-time basis or as a, as a retirement project. Um, but it does stimulate um, connection, it builds community. And the point I made in the chat is that we could make our hay without um, a, a community of friends around us who come and help us um, bring the hay in and, and their events. And it makes people connect to what we do. It allows us to, um, to tell a story about um, how we manage our, our small piece of land and, and it, it ties us into customers and customers into us. Yeah, I mean, those are all good points. In my book, I, I sort of, I, I, you know, I, I talk about um, commons versus um, private ownership models because I think sometimes that 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 whole debate, um, which is more of an academic debate really than than the way that farmers actually uh, go about things, uh, I think can be quite problematic. But I certainly agree with um, with Jane and Peter's comments. Uh, you know that that um that we do need to build um local small farm communities and and you know again one of the difficulties is you know if you're if you're the only small farmer or you know the only the only veg grower in town in my case um it it's it's tricky but um a part of that is kind of opening up the market a little bit so that um you know 95 percent of people aren't buying their veg um in sainsbury's you know
I'm going to keep the the floor open for some time and see if um, more comments and questions pop up. And otherwise, um, it might also be time to ask uh, Chris Walsh to come back in with some concluding thoughts. I don't know, Chris, uh, uh, main Chris, <laughs> do you, if you if you wanted <laughs> if you wanted to say something particular in closing, but um, otherwise, I would like to ask the other Chris <laughs> to um, to jump right, in. Yeah, I mean, um, well, I just want to thank everyone for the comments. It's been very interesting. I mean, I, I suppose um, one of the things I've picked up is the sort of impasse that we're at in present where, you know, the, the, the policy environment is um, really very hostile to um, all of the good things that we want to achieve. Um, I suppose I've been trying to argue that, um, you know, that will that will change by default a little bit like David Fleming's um, Lean Logic book, um, you know, that uh, I, I forget his exact phrase, but it's something like the, the, the heavy work of degrowth will be done for us. But I don't necessarily find that uh, an encouraging thought because I think that, you know, the way that that can, there's, there's all sorts of pretty negative ways that that can happen. Um, but I think, you know, we're in this, we're in this kind of weird, situation i think in global history really at the moment when it's very clear that the you know the systems that we're part of um um are you know have have a limited shelf life but nobody um, you know we all know that the system is broken but nobody you know that that you know nobody is really finding a, the the sort of the, the switch into um um the, the solutions that we need but um you know things are going to change and as you know as i keep saying you know we just have to be alive to those moments i think um but anyway uh I, thanks very much for, for all the comments i really appreciate that uh, you know i've learned a lot from listening to what people have said before you before you end there chris actually um john had another question um that maybe will be um and yeah, pull pull some of your last last thoughts out of your out of your mind my question was, if you think the government's going to bring um, a food security policy in, what would it look like in, if, what would you like it to look like? And how would you put, uh, or who would put the thoughts, those thoughts in the government's minds? Is it you? Is it some organization? How, how would that go about? Uh, it's definitely not going to be me, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, I know, um, you know, the, the Land Workers Alliance, for example, have, you know, have done a lot of work, um, sort of lobbying, um, but, you know, obviously there's a certain voices uh, get, get, get heard uh, more than others. Um, I mean, what, what the policy would look like, um, uh, I, you know, I, I think it has to start from um, sort of economically, um, lively and viable rural communities and healthy healthy food basically um you know which is um and and the thing the you know, point that other people i mean i talked a bit about woodland earlier and other people talked about things like abattoirs and local farm infrastructure i mean it's putting all those um pieces of the jigsaw uh, together um how that is uh going to get onto the um Get, get onto the agenda of government. I mean, I suppose part of my argument is that it's not, and what, what's actually going to happen is gov the, the power of central government is is going to wane uh, and people are going to have to figure this stuff out for themselves. But in as much as it might get onto the, uh, the agenda of government, I mean, I think with climate change and energy futures and um, an and economic crisis, uh, I think, as I was saying, um, a few minutes ago, I think suddenly food security is going to start um, rising up government agenda. Um, and, um, you know, we are actually going to start to need to look to our, um, to, to our, uh, our backyards, essentially, to provide us with the things that we need. Will it not be? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Will, it, will it not be because the, the government's, because um, the, the people are hungry? And will the government not try and go for big companies to, to produce the food then rather than small um, farming businesses? 
Yeah, I mean that 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 is that is a, a a possibility. I mean, you know, the 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 um the sort of energy um uh require, you know, it, it will be possible to keep cranking out um the commodity crops potentially um, you know, bread and circuses I suppose was the old uh, uh Roman approach. Yeah, I mean that 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 is a possibility. Um uh I you know, to, I I think I, uh, yeah, I, I you know I, I think there's going to be sort of crises propagating on numerous fronts that will make it um, difficult, and and one one of them is going to be um, you know global food commodity markets and the the um, the, the decline in um, the sort of global bread basket areas ability to um, you know to uh, to produce uh, food um, uh, you know that's that that's available in that sort of way. Um, but yeah, that certainly is um, one way it can go. Uh, I guess our, our job is for us to try and ensure that it doesn't. Thank you. And we have another Chris, actually, I just written, saw, saw, we have a Chris Frank. Chris, you, you, you asked a mes message in the chat. Would you like to just come in now? I think the question's been answered by um, by N. Yoxall. Um, she answered it very well, I think, uh, about the... Uh, my, my question is that we really need an organisation uh, or organisations or an overriding organisation over the ones that, uh, um, that's been suggested uh, below my uh, question to, uh, to buy land and... Um, uh, we desperately need more land, don't we? That seems to be the, the thing that's clogging up the works. If we're going to expand on, uh, on small farmers all over the country, all over the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, UK, uh, we, it's, it's the funds we need. And I'm not, I'm not convinced they aren't lots of sympathetic millionaires around um, who uh, really believe in this. Um, and uh, also, of course, it's, as I said, it's, it's building the small abattoirs that we've just been talking about. It's that infrastructure. Um, this can be done. It just takes a lot of organization. And although um, it's been put that the NFFN and PFLA, Food Ethics Council, Soil Association, are doing all this work, um, maybe we need uh, an organization looking over all of those to kind of more, more coordinate what's going on and report back to everybody. It, it, the more small organizations we have, uh, the more that work gets kind of lost and uh, we don't really see the big picture. Yeah, thanks. Well, perhaps I should just, uh, on that point of needing more land, I should probably put a, a pitch in for the Ecological Land Co-op that I'm involved with. Um, that is uh, basically trying to make uh, small holdings, uh, affordable small holdings available to people in perpetuity. I mean, the, the, and, and it raises, uh, it's a cooperative that raises community shares to do that. Um, I mean, the thing that grates with me slightly is that uh, land prices are so enormously high and, you know, that money goes into the pockets of landowners, uh, essentially. And I mean, that's the whole problem with uh, the, the, the sort of land market at the moment is that it's enormously um, weighted in favour of landowners um, and that sort of, which links back to a point I made earlier, um, uh, um, uh, a, a sort of about the dangers of uh, landlordism um but you know uh, it, there are indeed organizations that are doing um the all sorts of things as best they can and um you know we we need as much of that as possible what about um asking local councils to offer it to local organizations before they sell on to large rich landlords i mean is that not happening or or you mean like with the county farms? Um, yeah, exactly, when they're having to be sold off. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if anyone else, I mean, I certainly know of uh, down here in the southwest um, some some fairly unenlightened behaviour by uh, local authorities that, um, you know, have, have basically not been uh, open to, um, uh, to, to keeping um, the 
farm estate in in agriculture but i mean i know i think in norfolk i i, I think there's sort of more interesting things going on but I, I don't know about other parts of the country i mean i think the the yeah again in the context of local authority funding i think the the sort of pound signs in the eyes of um of uh of um chief executives in terms of selling land for development um you know is, is pretty strong um but certainly that that's a dimension that i think um needs emphasizing for sure Chris Walsh, would you like to say a few things? Yeah, I just wanted to, to thank Chris. I really enjoyed it. I, I was nervous coming to this because I, I knew the book was, um, you know, offered a real hopeful vision for the future and it gives a real clear framework for what those things need to be in the future. But as probably like yourself, I'm, I'm a person who needs to know how we're going to get there. And, and I was worried that this was going to be a really pessimistic conversation. And, and although we don't know how we're going to get there, it's just been really enjoyable to be with a group of people who are having the same conversations and the same angst. And, you know, all of us have the same challenges, yet, you know, I'm in Manchester, you know, I probably got similar challenges to the guy in Durham. Um, but also the crofters in Scotland and it was just um, I think for me I've come away from it thinking there is a lot of hope we don't know how we're going to get there we just kind of need to be ready um, and a lot of this is out of our control but it feels like your book kind of is a little bit of a call to action on that kind of be ready for for this and this is where we want to take this so thank you it was great. Well, thank you. Uh, and it's been, I mean, uh, one of my worries with the book is that it's all quite sort of uh, abstract and trying to, trying to sort of find a, uh, you know, a bigger framework for this. And I'm sure there's parts of it that uh, many people will disagree with, but the, the key thing I think is, is that we need to be having these sorts of conversations and we need to be thinking about these issues. And, and it's actually been really inspiring to hear from, um, from all of you this evening all, all the different work that people are doing and you know sort of just just promoting those connections between us um uh so so thank you also um it's been really informative for me yes thanks chris i really enjoyed this session as well and um there is still a few minutes but uh it's also late in the day and Maybe people want to drop off slowly or um, otherwise, you know, unmute yourselves and, and, and just um, make the last comment or, or the last question. The floor is open. I, I don't mind um, just briefly going back to the point about sort of new identities and, and such like the, the, that Chris had in his, his list of five. Um, I think that's, I mean, I, I, I live on the, on more or less on the border of England and Scotland and that is a, um, the sort of fuzzy border stuff is something that comes across with us all the time. Um, I, I'm closer to Edinburgh than I am to Leeds. Um, so when I go to um, I've been training things and things like that, I often go into Scotland rather than into England. Um, I run a farmer's market, which uh, draws people in from the Northwest and from the Northeast. And um, you, you need probably for um, sort of formalities, you need, um, some structures that are based on on a geography of some sort but in reality people on the ground work out their own their own ways of of being in different places and and the, being part of different places it's not it's not that desperate um that you can't relate to um stuff that's going on and people that's that are on the other side of the line really Well, Chris, I also thought actually that the, to me the the point on 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 identities is um, 
is really important and you know it's a it's a worrying question as well because i'm uh, um like you say there are sort of models that exist but it's all it can be so abstract can't it because in reality we see we see so many divisions um upheld by identity politics and uh Mm, yeah i'm hoping i'm hoping for a civic republicanism <laughs> that would be great or you know just that realization that we're all here now and and we need to work together and potentially uh as the system fails more i'm you know maybe maybe that is that is when people realize more that uh you know working in solidarity with those around you is is really crucial but um yeah there is, of course, always the worry of, of it, it, it getting, the divisions getting greater. But I, I really appreciated that that point was part of your five points, because I don't think it's necessarily one that would come up in, you know, in, in, um, in, in thinking around um, ecological farms or, yeah, so I, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, there are many worries, um, but, you know, I think that in, in some ways, um, uh, you know, may, maybe my, my perspective is simplistic, but I think sometimes if, you, you know, basically I think we will be confronted with the, the issue of how do I, you know, how do I make a livelihood and how do I create a, a congenial life out of, um, from the land where I live uh, with the people who are living around me. And, um, you know, I think we need to focus in on that question and, and it does kind of concentrate the mind and, simplify some of the uh yeah you know we get wrapped up in all these debates and divisions about um you know the nature of the world but um you know producing a local livelihood and and um uh, you know with the people who are in place i think um is, is kind of a good basis to go forward from seems like is this a, an appropriate moment with the uh, everyone's uh, gone quiet <laughs> to uh yeah the, the, so jane actually jane put a new put a put a message in the in the chat and she says um the problem is that even pre-ordered copies of the book won't be here for a couple of weeks <laughs> but this has been a most enjoyable and enlightening taster thank you oh great okay so that's jane, that's jane from, <laughs> Thanks. from orkney and i did it, there is a, i did put a link there is a launch again an online launch event on the 13th of october that uh, everyone is welcome to, to come to where i will be in discussion with peter mcfadgen the author of flat pack democracy and jody fernandez that uh, many of you might know who's uh, uh involved in the land workers alliance and and, and numerous other um uh food and social justice activism um so um uh, yeah I, I hope you might um visit there and i'll, I'll sort of update things on on my blog um about the book uh, so Chris, I, I just want to say that I don't see the link in the in the chat. So um, oh. um, if you have put something there, then I'm not sure how come that I can't see. Uh, it. At the very I top of the chat, I wrote a little note hi, and then I uh, I I put the five themes for discussion, and then underneath that, I put a link. If you're interested in my book, uh, there's an online launch event on 13th of October, and there's a URL there. I don't know if people can see that so i can't see that probably because i joined after you written it and so oh, that okay. might be the case for some other people so if they you know we only see the chat from the moment we joined so do, if oh, you want to okay. just copy and paste it now so that then everybody has it um everybody all right has it now. Uh, let me see what i can do i knew my um my lack of techiness would uh, come haunt me in this <laughs> so i've re Posted. There you go. That's now it's all there. See that? Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. And so there we have the launch and everything. So that's great. And and I will I will definitely save that now. So the the chat as it is now with with your message in the end um, okay. will will be saved. And there will and the recording of this is also available. I mean, not that I imagine you will all go over it, but <laughs> um, you know, if there is. <laughs> 
if there's something you need to get back to or if you want to encourage other people to to listen in then then um, the recording will be made available on the the northern real farming conference website so great um i think we're gonna say goodbye hey right goodbye and thanks very much for for joining my session thank thanks, you everyone bye bye bye, -bye.